This morning, if you have your Bibles, please grab them and open them with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. And I do want to start with a word of prayer. And I would appreciate over the next few weeks, as you all remember or think about it, if you would pray for me as well. Um, I'm excited to teach through all this, uh, but nonetheless, I need your prayers. And I sure enough thank you for it ahead of time. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today. And Lord, we are so excited to open your word. Father, I am grateful, Lord, for the truth that we find within the pages of Scripture. Lord, I'm thankful that we have one thing in this world that is never changing. That is you, Lord, and that is your word. It's never changing. It's always going to be constant. It's never going to end. Lord, I thank you that we can come to your word for absolute truth. And we find within the pages of your word, God, answers to things about life Definitely the answer and the way to salvation. And so, Lord, as we begin to continue to teach through the prophecy, Lord, in the end times or the coming of the end of the age, uh, Lord, I pray that you would be our teacher. And, Lord, I ask, God, that you would help me this morning and that, Lord, you would uh, help those that are listening even today to hear from your spirit and hear from your word. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for the last few weeks uh, in our time together, we have been looking into the answers that Christ was given, giving his disciples to the questions they had asked concerning what Jesus had said prior to his death, burial, resurrection, and his ascension, things that were of great interest to them and that are still of great interest to you and I. It appears that the world is very evident about this coming disaster or this coming judgment upon the earth. In fact, many of your movies that you'll watch today, the ones that have been coming out for several years, all are very fascinated with the end of the world, how this is going to happen. Of course, Marvel movies are all uh, have their own slant on how this is going to happen, this great end of the age and what's going to take place. It's as if the world itself has somewhat of an idea that something is coming upon the earth. And the truth is, there is something coming upon the earth. And um, the disciples were with Christ, and he had been sharing with them, uh, of course, for three years, and uh, he was soon to go to the cross to pay the penalty and to make atonement for the sin of the world and to redeem each and every one who would place their faith and trust in Christ. And that had not yet happened, but nonetheless, he was going to the cross soon, and he was going to be leaving his disciples, and he promised his disciples something in uh, the 14th chapter of John that he was going to do, that he was going to leave, go to the Father, but when he went to the Father, he was going to send someone in his place, his replacement, if you will. He was going to send the third person of the Godhead, and that is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, who had been with them in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, was actually going to indwell them, empower them, He was going to serve the purpose of Christ being with them in a much greater way. He was actually going to be in them. And that was going to take place. We know that happened in Acts chapter 2. But Jesus was leaving now the, the temple and the city of Jerusalem, and he would not return there again until um, he was going to be tried and then taken to uh, the mount where he would be on Golgotha, where he'd be crucified just shortly after this. But nonetheless, he uh, was answering some questions his disciples said. As he left the city, as you remember, Jesus said that the temple that they were admiring and that they were just in awe of was going to be torn down, that it was actually going to be completely destroyed, and so was the city. And so they were very curious about when these things obviously were going to take place. So in Matthew chapter 24, we're going to read just a few verses, and then we're going to continue on within the prophecy of the Word of God. And you remember that in the 19th chapter of Revelation that we learned that what it says about Jesus in in um, Revelation chapter 19, starting in verse 12, he talks about the fact that for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And that's what we're getting to here is we're looking at the testimony of Jesus, the entire word of God through the prophets and everything else pointing to a point in time in the future where things are going to take place and that's going to happen. You can guarantee yourself it will. But here in the 24th uh, chapter of 
of uh, the book of Matthew. You also find accounts of this in Luke chapter 21 and also in Mark chapter 13. But let's read through here about 14 verses starting in verse 3. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be? When are you God going to Christ? When is the temple going to be destroyed? That was the first question they had. They wanted to know when is this going to happen? The next thing, they move on and says, and what will be the sign of your coming? They knew that Christ was coming again. He hadn't even left yet, but they knew that he was coming again. And then he, they said this, and also they wanted to know, when was the end of the age? When is the end of the age? And so Jesus now, in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, is going to lay out for them the events of these things that will take place to answer the questions the disciples have just made concerning what was going to happen currently from there until the end of the age and the time of his coming. And he moves from there and says this, very important that we understand this today. It's been important for the entire church age, but I'm telling you today, it's extremely important that you understand what Jesus is saying here to his disciples, and it's reiterated to you and I this morning through the word of God. The first thing Jesus says is, see that no one leads you astray. He's saying the possibility of being led astray is going to be very, very great. The reason is, in verse 5, for many will come in my name, saying that I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. He said, see that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. And we've talked about this, I don't remember if it's Wednesday night or a Sunday, how the world wars begin to happen. We know World War I and then World War II and how we know that these wars, these, these international wars, these world wars are the beginning now of the birth pains that are leading up to the answers to the questions these disciples have just asked. And as birth pains begin to happen, their, their, their intermittent stages are further apart. But as we draw closer to the end of the age and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, these things are going to be happening at a very rapid pace. Very rapid pace. And then he moves on in verse 9. He says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. Of course, that happened to the disciples. It's also been happening to Christians throughout the age. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Verse 11, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And you can read the remaining of this, and we'll get through some of this in the next several weeks as we move through this in the following part of chapter 24 and then in chapter 25. The disciples wanted to know the answers to these questions, and so Christ laid these out for them. The one thing they were very sure of, and you can guarantee it's going to happen, the Bible's very clear on this, is the fact that Jesus Christ is coming again. He's coming again. It's going to happen, guaranteed it will happen. We do not know, as it says in Matthew 24, the day nor the hour. We don't know when that's going to be because he's given us some signs that are pointing to his second coming, but we do not know the day or the hour. Anyone who sets dates, obviously, I told you before, ignore those. But we do know that he's given signs, things that are going to happen leading up to the time of his return. What we're going to look at now as we get into the... Uh, the, the, the answer to the questions, we're going to look at something I think that's very, very critical. And the question is going to be this. Well, what about the church, John? What about the bride of Christ? In order for us to really grasp and understand this, we need to realize something, that the Bible shares some different examples about those that God has loved. Number one, in the Old Testament, we have the nation of Israel. And God says that he was betrothed to the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel is looked at as a feminine 
It is the female, if you will, the feminine to, to God. And God himself chose the nation of Israel out of all the nations of the earth. He chose them as a people of his own. And he made covenants with the nation of Israel and with the father of the nation of Israel, with Abraham. And his covenants are passed down through Isaac and Jacob. And we have the covenants that God made to the nation of Israel. How many of you know that God does not break his covenants? He will not break his covenant. Now we also know that Jesus, on the night before he was crucified, he raised the fourth, the fourth cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. There's another covenant that he was going to be making. And it's going to be a covenant that he was making now that would be his blood. His blood would be poured out for the, the sins of, of many. And that he was going to give his life as a atoning sacrifice for the sin of the world. As he would pay the penalty of the sin of humanity and take upon himself the sin of the world. That happened, we know, when Jesus Christ gave his own life, laid it down on the cross of Calvary. He did that for you and he did that for me. And we know that the church is called something in scripture. We know the church is called the bride of Christ. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 5, we know that we as husbands are supposed to pattern the way that we love our wives as Christ did for the church, and he gave his life up for her. The church is the bride of Christ. So in the Old Testament, you have the nation of Israel. In the New Testament, as we have Christ now coming, the Old Testament, the nation of Israel as a whole, rejected Christ. Now the church age is set up and established, and now this blood covenant that Jesus poured out for the sins of the world now, we know the church begins in Acts chapter 2, and now we have a period of time of this age of grace. The Old Testament was under law. The New Testament were under grace. And then we find in Revelation, we find another feminine form of a harlot church. We find this harlot church in Revelation chapter 17. And the harlot we're going to look at in the coming weeks about who is the harlot church in Revelation chapter 17. What has happened to the bride of Christ in the tribulation period, the final seven of Daniel's 77s? Where is the church? We're going to look at that this morning about where the church is. And then the nation of Israel, obviously, will also be there in the time of tribulation, going through the judgments of God upon the earth. We know that because in Daniel 9, chapter, 20, I mean, t- chapter 9, verses 24, there's something very interesting that we find there. And I want to point this out to you just briefly. In, 20, in the 24th verse of chapter 9, Daniel receiving this, this, this prophecy, and there's many of them throughout Daniel, but this one says this. In his vision, he says, 77s are decreed about your people, which are the Jews, and your holy city, Jerusalem. And what we learn in Romans chapter 9 is, is that not that Israel as a nation, through all of Romans, has rejected as a whole now that Jesus Christ is their Messiah. But there would be a remnant of Jews who would be saved by grace. And in fact, they would be brought into the church age, into the bride of Christ. And then we rock along there in Romans chapter 11 and towards the end of Romans chapter 11, starting in about verse 25, Paul makes it clear, lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers, speaking of the mystery of the church. This is going to be the the time period between the 69 week with Jesus had fulfilled most of those things right there when he came and then the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And that was all in Daniel's prophecy. And then we have right here this mystery, and he says a partial hardening has come upon Israel. So Israel has been hardened, and now the the Gentiles as a big group, and the Jews as a small group, the remnant being brought in, being saved by grace now in this this period of time called the church age that we are currently in, are being saved by grace. It says, until the fullness of Gentiles has come in. There is a fullness of Gentiles in the church age when that will come to a close. And that's what we're going to look at this morning as we make our way into the prophecies of what Daniel has said in the prophecy of Revelation, the book of Revelation, the revelation of Christ. So we find in Revelation chapter 18 that this harlot that we know of, that she is judged, and uh, we're going to learn more about that. Then Revelation 19, we see something very, very interesting. So in Revelation chapter 1, hang here with me just for a second. Revelation chapter 1, we see the glorified Christ. 
Revelation chapter 2 and 3, he writes these letters to his church in which he is in the midst of his church. They were literal churches, but it is also the church of all time. It is, it is in fact, if you study the church age, you're going to find that every one of those churches was throughout the church age. And we'll learn more about that as we move forward. And then you get to Revelation chapter 4, and John has a vision, and he sees a doorway in heaven, and he's caught up into heaven. And all of a sudden, in Revelation chapter 4, now what we see is John is in heaven, and he's now in the throne room of God, and he sees all the things around the throne of God. And then in the fifth chapter of the book of Revelation, now John sees there's one who had been slain from the foundation of the world, a lamb. And the elder says, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, there was no one worthy to take the scroll and open it. And that's the title deed to the earth. And here comes the lamb who had been slain from the foundation of the world. And he takes the scroll. That's the title deed to the earth. And now in chapter 6, now Jesus Christ begins to pop open the seals. And these are the judgments of God upon the earth. But in the Revelation chapter 19, we see something very interesting. In Revelation 19, if you want to go there quickly, I want to read this to you so you can see what I'm saying. Revelation chapter 19. Start in verse 11. All of a sudden now we see the church, the bride of Christ, who was on earth in Revelation 2 and 3, now is in heaven in Revelation chapter 19. So something has happened. And in the 11th verse, it says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. This is now Christ. He's coming now to judge the world. He's coming as judge. He came the first time as a lamb. He's coming as a lion the second time. And it says, His eyes are like the flame of fire, and his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. Now listen, here we are. The armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. You say, John, well, who is that? Well, let's go up here just a few verses, and we're going to find out who they are. If you go up here to verse 6, you're going to find something here. There's a song that's being sung, and it says, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give Him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride, here we are, the bride of Christ, has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. And then right after that, we see at his second coming, the bride is coming with him, riding white horses, taking part in this great, unbelievable um, victory that Jesus has. So something has happened. The church in Revelation 2 and 3 is on earth, and Jesus is there among his churches, and he's writing these letters to the seven churches. But in Revelation chapter 19, the church is in heaven. They're giving their white garments, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And now there is the return of the church, the bride of Christ, with Jesus Christ as he comes the second time. In Revelation chapter 17, though, we see a a church. And she's present. And she's here among the earth. But the Bible calls her a harlot. She's a prostitute, if you will. And, and what we're going to learn here in the next few weeks, we're going to find out who this is. This is what we know for a fact. Go with me to John. I'm going to go through this, and we're going to teach you from the Word of God where the church is and why the church is in heaven and why the church is not here during the final seven years of the tribulation. Why is the church not there? In fact, you will not see them in the tribulation anywhere. You'll see the word the elect. How many of you know the Jews are the elect of God as well? 
In fact, 144,000 Jews are going to be sealed and they are going to be the greatest evangelists and there's going to be an incredible revival and a credible incoming of those who are outside of Christ. They're going to preach the gospel. They're going to teach the gospel. They're going to proclaim the gospel. And so we find this in John. Go with me there to John chapter 14. This is prior to Jesus' death. He's going to explain some things to us. We're going to learn about where the church is and why this is so important, important, Christian, that you get this. Why it's so important that you understand this, because this is involving you as a Christian. If you're not in Christ, this is not speaking of you. In fact, if you reject Christ, you will be here if Jesus was to return and the end of the ages to come. Listen, you'll be in that tribulation period if the time of Christ was to happen now, if it happens soon. But listen to this. In John chapter 14, Jesus says, Let not your hearts be troubled. He was going to be leaving and going to the Father. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, listen, I will come again and will take you to myself. And where I am, you may be also. In verse 4, and you know the, the way to where I'm going. And Thomas says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And then Jesus says this, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus says, I'm going to the Father. And Thomas, you know where I'm going because the way that you're going to get to the Father where I'm going is going to be through me. Jesus tells his disciples, I'm going away, guys, but I'm going away to do something to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may also be. Where did Jesus go? We know that he ascended into heaven and he now is seated at the right hand of the Father and he's interceding for us on our behalf as our great high priest. And so Jesus is in heaven and he's coming again now. He tells his disciples, I'm coming back to get you and to take you where I am. Now the second coming of Christ is Christ coming from where he is to earth. There is a big difference here. This one is the church, the body of Christ, the believers, those that started with the apostles making their way through. This is now where they are going to be, Jesus is going to come get them and take them to where he is. And then we understand in Revelation 19, we are going to come with him when he returns. There's going to be some things that happen in heaven while we're there. We'll get into that as well. But those things are also given to us in Scripture. Now, number one, Jesus was going to the Father. Number two, Jesus was going to prepare a place for us. Number three, Jesus said, I will come again. And the fourth thing he promised is, I'm going to come again and take you with me that you may be where I am also. That is a promise he gave his disciples. Now, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I want you to flip over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is a passage of Scripture that I often use when I'm, when I'm doing a committal service at a graveside at a funeral. And I use this often. I use this even at funerals of a non-believer. And I don't speak in the tense of that person necessarily being in Christ, but I speak about for those who are in Christ. And I want to give us a beautiful here illustration. Paul lays this out for the church in Thessalonica. And he's talking about the coming of the Lord. And now he's going to lay this out for them in verses 13 through 18, if you'll follow along with me in 1 Thessalonians. And we're going to answer this question to what happened to the church. Why do we see him in, Roman, in Revelation 2 and 3? John goes up to heaven. We don't see the church on the earth again, but we see the church coming down from heaven in the 19th chapter with Jesus. Well, we're going we're gonna to look at what takes place here. So here we are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verses 13, continuing through 18. But we do not want you, Paul says, to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. 
For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God, listen to this, this is very important, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. There it is again. All those who have fallen asleep in Christ, when Jesus comes again to receive us unto himself, listen, he's bringing with him all those who have died in Christ. It's very important that you get this. Because the church of Thessalonica was concerned here about what happens to believers when they die. There's some that are going to teach you about soul sleep. This, we're not in soul sleep. There is no such thing as us laying in the body, in the tomb, waiting for the day when Jesus comes back. No, he's bringing with him those who have fallen asleep. It's very obvious their body is still in the grave. So he's bringing back with him the spirits of those who have fallen asleep. We see in Revelation also where the spirits of those that were martyred during the tribulation are crying out to God, when are you going to avenge our blood? And he gives them a garment to wear. Those who have died in Christ, he says, don't worry, they're coming with him when he comes back to receive you. Then he goes on and says this, for we declare in verse 15, to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, listen, not everyone is going to experience the first death. Because when Jesus comes again, there will be Christians who are alive here on the earth. So we won't experience the first death if you happen to be alive when he comes again. For who are left until the coming of the Lord? We will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry, command of the voice of the archangel, and those who have died are coming with him. And with the sound of the trumpet of God, listen to this. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up. We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So what happens to a Christian when they die, he or she? They immediately go to be with the Lord. That's where they go. Jesus' spirit didn't stay in his body when he died. His body was placed in a rented tomb. And let me tell you this. Every spot in every cemetery that has been purchased by you is nothing more Christian than paying rent until Jesus comes again. That is not the final resting place for your body. And there was a time when I first began in ministry where I would do a graveside service and I'd say, well, here's the final resting place of brother or Mr. So-and-so. It's not true. This is only like Jesus, he had a rented tomb. It was only going to be used for a short time. And for those who have died in Christ, their body, this outside fleshly garment that we wear, that houses our spirit, who we really are, who houses that, it will be laid in the ground. But the spirit will go be with God. That's where the spirit goes. Now, if you're not a believer in Christ, your spirit doesn't go to be with God. Your spirit goes to the waiting place of the dead. And one day that's going to be dealt with too at the very end of the age, very, very end, at the great white throne judgment. So these bodies of ours, yes, they may be there for, for, for hundreds, maybe even a thousand, two thousand years as the early disciples. Their spirit is with the Lord Jesus Christ, but he's coming again and he didn't come just to redeem the soul. He came to completely reverse the curse that happened in the Garden of Eden. And he's going to redeem not only our soul, which he did on the cross of Calvary, but he's going to redeem our bodies that have been given over to decay because of sin. Those bodies are going to be resurrected and they are going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye to a body that will be fit for all eternity. And so the dead in Christ are going to come back with Jesus when he comes. He's going to give a command the bodies that were decayed, or whether they're in the oceans, or whether they've been burned at the stake in the inquisitions, whatever it may be, he's going to gather those things up, and those bodies now will be changed, joined with their spirits, and they will now have a body like that of Christ for all eternity. Your body and my body, if it happened today, will be changed in a moment. And we will have a body like that of Christ, fitted for all eternity. And that's why he says, encourage one another with these words. I have done funerals for people who do not know Christ. And let me tell you something. 
There is absolute, total, complete grieving that happens because there is no hope for someone outside of Christ. They're only waiting for the final judgment where they will also experience what the Bible says is the second death where they will be thrown into the lake of fire that wasn't prepared for them but was prepared for Satan and his angels. So they've rejected the only means by which man may get to God, and that is through Jesus Christ. But for many of you today, which you're hearing over the airwaves and watching on TV and listening to these religious leaders around the world, they're all telling you these days there's all ways to get to God. If you're a Buddhist, if you're a Hindu, if you're a Muslim, it makes no difference. We all love God. We're just getting there on different paths. My Bible says there's only one way to God, and it's through the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is the only way you'll get there. And I know the reason you're cheering for that is because we understand as Christians we have an obligation for the gospel to share that, to teach it, to preach it to those we love. Because it's the only way of salvation. Say, John, that's narrow. It is narrow. Narrow is the way. Small is the gate that leads to life. That is what the Bible says. There is only one way. Now, the word in verse 17 that we see here is the word caught up. It just, it's, it's a word, it means harpazio. It's, that's what the Greek word of that is. We know that the New Testament was not written in English. It was written in what? Greek. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. And so the word here means this, to seize, to catch up, to snatch away. It's also the same word that we find in John 10, 28, where Jesus says, I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. And no one will snatch them. No one will harpazio them out of my hand. So we find here this word harpazio means caught up. That there's going to be a catching up of the body of Christ. When he has got it prepared for us, when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, the king of glory is coming for his bride, the church. And when he gives the command, the dead in Christ, their bodies, along with their spirits, coming with the Lord Jesus Christ, will be united together. And those of us who are alive and remain upon the earth will be caught up with him in the clouds to be with the Lord forever. That is the catching up that's going to happen. That is the explanation so far as we see of why the church is on earth in Revelation 2 and 3, but the church comes with Christ in Revelation chapter 19. Something happened from chapter 3 to get them there in chapter 19. And that's what we find in chapter 4 when John the Apostle sees an open door and he goes up into the throne room of heaven. There's a catching up. It's coming. Some people say, well, John, the church has to go through the tribulation because she still needs purification. My Bible tells me that I have the righteousness of Christ in him. That I am made righteous already by his blood. I don't have to do what some churches teach and what others believe. I don't have to go through a period of time that is unbiblical, that is not right, that is a figment of men's imagination, a place called purgatory. I don't have to go through a place after all of the things I've done to go through a purification process where my sins, venial or mortal, whatever, are burnt off and I spend however many thousand years there going through this burning purification process before I go to heaven. That is nothing but the imagination of men. That is not biblical, it's not true, and there are millions who believe that. It's not true. Jesus died once for sin, for all. Not, not, not twice, three times, a hundred times, or every week. He's died one time. We have to understand you're either in Christ or you're out of Christ. If you're in Christ, you have his righteousness. And it's not about anything you do, anything you accomplish, or anything you work. It's about what he finished when he said it is finished. He accomplished it. He paid for it. He atoned. He's redeemed. He has purchased you. We need to understand that, especially as we move into the day and age and we look at this apostate church. We're going to learn some things here as we move forward. Paul says our hope is this in in Titus chapter 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Why? Because we're waiting for our blessed hope. What is the Christian's blessed hope? Dear friend, it is the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The church is waiting and has been waiting for the return of its Savior, Jesus Christ, where he is going to take us to meet him in the air in the clouds and be with him forever. It's pretty amazing. 
Moving along here. Go with me next to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's flip over there just a little ways and you'll find it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There's so many things that we could discuss here this morning. I hope that I'm setting this in your mind to help you understand. There is a doctrine, a teaching of the word rapture. No, the word rapture is not in the Bible. It's an English word that simply means caught up. We know harpazio is a Greek word, caught up, snatched up. I know the church talks about that. You can just say snatched up. We've been taken out. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul the Apostle here, uh, starting in verses uh, 51, going to share with us another mystery here i'm going to start in verse 50 i tell you the truth brothers flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of god nor does the perishable inherit imperishable behold paul says i tell you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall all be changed. When Jesus Christ comes for his bride, and he will come, we will be snatched up into heaven where he has been preparing a place for us. We understand the economy as we study the word of God that we have the nation of Israel. Listen to me. Do not confuse the nation of Israel with the church. The nation of Israel, God still has covenant promises that are yet to be fulfilled. That's the beauty of us living in this day and time, looking back at history. How the nation of Israel, who was dispersed from the very place of where it was in A.D. 70, has been dispersed throughout the entire world. And not until the Second World War, talking about the beginning of birth pains, World War I, which developed a, 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 a love for Zionism. And then you have World War II. And then out of that comes where all of a sudden now the nation of Israel through the United Nations has been given their land back to go and to go back to their homeland. So the nation of Israel, after the world, Second World War, where Hitler tried to annihilate and wipe out the Jews, guess what happened? God says, no, I'm not done with Israel. All of a sudden, the Jews who were left over from the Holocaust, guess where they went? They began to go back to their homeland. In 1948, they established a Jewish state. They've been there ever since. And they're there to this day. Why? Because one of the promises that God made the nation of Israel was this, that I'm going to gather them for the four corners of the world. He's going to gather them back to their land. He's done that in your day and in my time. He's done that because he's God. He's not through with the nation of Israel, nor is he through with the city of Jerusalem. Why? Because he told Daniel, there's 77s decreed for your people. The final seven is not done yet. It's coming in the future where God will then once again, when he removes his bride, the church, out of the way, those that were saved by the remnant of grace, the Jews and the Gentiles combined, through the church age, when the fullness comes in, God reverts back and fulfills the covenant promises that he has with the nation of Israel. And that is still coming in the future. It's in our day and time that we see these things happening. And it brings us joy, it brings us peace, it brings all kinds of excitement knowing that Jesus Christ is fulfilling the very prophecy because he is the spirit of prophecy. Now, if you go with me to Acts chapter, um, Acts chapter 1 quickly. Acts chapter 1. After Jesus had suffered his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We see something here that he spends 40 days now talking to his disciples about the kingdom. See, what they were supposed to do is they were supposed to go out. They were going to receive the Holy Spirit. Let me say this about the Holy Spirit before we go any further. It's important that you understand that Jesus promised he would send them the one that would teach them, comfort them, would live in them, would, 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 would protect all these things the Holy Spirit does. He would teach them everything that the Father said and remind them of what Christ had said. The Holy Spirit has a role. Jesus says, I'm going to go to the Father, and when I do, I'm going to send someone to come in my place. Guess who he was? He was the Holy Spirit who is in you today. He is the true vicar of Christ. There is only one true substitute of Jesus Christ, one true replacement of Jesus Christ. It is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. 
No man takes the role of the replacement of Christ. No man. For all men are flesh and blood. All men, every single man, will stand before the judgment of God. All men are born in sin. Every single man, every single woman are born in sin. Christ came and redeemed all to himself. He sent his vicar, the one who would take his place, the Holy Spirit. So in Acts chapter 1, the disciples are gathering with Jesus there, and they begin to ask him some questions. And in verse 6, after Jesus had told them, in verse 5, he says, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now, we know in Acts chapter 2 it happened, but in verse 6 it says, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time, this is very important, will you, this is after his death, burial, and resurrection, He's getting ready to ascend to the Father and send the Spirit of God. He says, you are going to go and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. That's what they were going to do. They ask him this question, very, very fascinating question, very important question. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? See, they're still waiting for this to take place. God's promise for the nation of Israel that David's throne would be an everlasting throne and a king would sit on that throne forever and ever and ever. We know Jesus Christ will sit on the throne. And that from Jerusalem, the world, the world would be ruled from Jerusalem. Christ is coming back. He's going to land on the Mount of Olives, the very place right here in Acts chapter 1 that he ascended from. He's coming again. And he'll land there again. So why all the business about Israel today? Because it's a reminder of God's covenant promises. He's coming again for his bride. The bride will be taken out. God will move to the nation of Israel. Fulfilling the 70th 7 of Daniel's vision. And that's why the disciple says, Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? And then he says, Listen. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. See, the very, very, very encouraging truth this morning for all of Christians who die, they go be with the Lord He's coming again to receive us unto himself, to take us to where he is. There's, there's, there's an event that's going to happen, and it's going to happen prior to the scrolls being popped, the seals being popped, where God begins to pour out his judgment upon the earth. The bride of Christ is not there because the bride of Christ is in heaven. And the bride of Christ will be at the Bema seat where the rewards are going to be given. And then we're going to have the marriage supper of the Lamb, And then Christ is coming with his church. And he is coming now to judge. After he pours out his wrath for that 70th seven. And we're going to learn about that as we move forward. By the way, you and I are looking forward to this blessed hope of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is coming to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify us for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. I hope that that is a blessing to you today. As you think about this, the truth is we can encourage one another with these words. There's a whole lot more to this picture than just a great apocalypse. There's coming a day where Christ will rule and reign upon the earth with an iron rod from the city of Jerusalem. And the Bible says, listen, Christian, you and I will rule and we will reign with Christ. What an incredible truth. This is not all there is, folks. Jesus is coming again. What does that do? That encourages us to live godly, holy, and righteous lives as we wait for the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. And Lord, I thank you so much for your incredible salvation. Lord, I ask, Lord, that you would just Create a desire in the hearts of your people to to, to get into your word. 
Lord, you know that, that today, especially in our day and even in the days in past, men just follow men. Lord, nowhere are we ever to follow a man. God, we are to follow you. We must know your word so that we're not deceived. We're not led astray. And we see so much of this happening in our day, God, with so much of this false garbage out there that they're calling Christianity. And so many within this generation are falling into this, this unbelievable trap, God, of deception. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be like those of the Bereans, God, that we studied the word. Lord, I pray that this church wouldn't take what I say, Lord, but they would get into the word of God and trust your Holy Spirit to teach them and show them the word. I thank you, Lord, for the promise, God, of your return. We thank you, Lord, that death isn't the end, Lord. And oh, God, there's so much more. Father, the truth is we never fully ever die. God, we don't. Our spirit will live forever, but you're coming again and our bodies will be resurrected one day to have one like yours, Christ, suited for all eternity where we will rule and reign with you upon this earth. We thank you for these truths. I pray that your people are encouraged today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.